legends. The players that are remembered long after their playing days end, and indeed long after they too pass. The players that live on in mythology and reverence, that have influenced the game we see today. They are players who have set records, won championships, and captured our attention, etching their legacies into the foundations of this game. A legend is special, not simply because their talent set them apart, but because their stories transcend the individual. In fact, to me, that is what a legend is. A remarkable player who tells a story that enthralls us. So today, I'd like to talk about the legend of Kobe Bryant. The Black Mamba, Kobe Bean Bryant. Where do you start with one of the most polarizing, recognizable, famous basketball players of all time who happens also to be one of its greatest? As enigmatic an athlete or person of interest as you are likely to find in the last 50 years of American pop culture. He was often a person that was difficult to describe, empathize with, or relate to. As his former teammate Brian Shaw said, Kobe sometimes isolated himself in his relentless pursuit to be the best who ever played the game. Bryant wore nearly every mask that can be worn. A winner, a loser, competitive, petty, selfish, unshakable, prodigy, flameout, idol, and pariah. Kobe spent every minute of his 20-year professional career with the Los Angeles Lakers forging a legend that is one of the most interesting in contemporary sports. As he was in most aspects, Kobe Bryant's upbringing was atypical. He spent his formative years from ages 6 to 13 in Italy, where his father, Joe Jellybean Bryant, played professionally after a five-year stint in the NBA. There, Kobe became fluent in Italian as well as Spanish, acclimatized himself to Italian culture, and began falling in love with the game of basketball. When he did return to America with his family, to Philadelphia, at 13 years old, Bryant was faced with the same terrifying challenge that all teenage Americans must face. Starting high school. But unlike most American teenagers, Bryant hadn't grown up in America. He had left his closest friends a continent away and had become so accustomed to the Italian language that he found it awkward to transition back to English, perplexed by American slang. He found it difficult to make friends, and so instead of going to parties, Kobe spent his weekends in the gym, honing his skills as a basketball player. He made the varsity roster as a freshman, but did more watching than playing as the Lower Marion Aces went 4-20 on the season. Still, his love of the game and confidence in his ability never wavered. He had the temperament of an obsessive, and in the face of the haunting loneliness of pubescent isolation, Kobe Bryant like millions of other kids just like him, found solace in an empty gym watching leather go through nylon. When he returned for his sophomore season, Kobe Bryant was ready. That freshman team had gone four and 20. Over the next three years, Kobe led the Aces to a 77 and 13 record. By his senior year, Kobe Bryant was the number one high school prospect in the nation. He took home a trove of National Player of the Year awards after passing Wilt Chamberlain to become Philadelphia's all-time high school leading scorer and leading the Aces to their first state championship in over 50 years. Unlike other high school standouts from years prior though, Kobe's senior year was not marked by a burning curiosity as to where he would go to college. The basketball world wondered if he would go to college. The year prior, in the 1995 NBA Draft, Kevin Garnett had declared his intention to forego college and make himself eligible to be drafted directly out of high school. And with the fifth overall pick, the Minnesota Timberwolves made Kevin Garnett the first basketball player in 20 years to be drafted right out of high school. The decision opened the floodgates. Obviously, as the top prospect in the nation, virtually every college in the country was vying for Bryant's commitment. But all of a sudden, there was the possibility that this 17-year-old kid could just say, forget it, I'm ready, this is my time, I'm going pro. 
at a press conference in 1996, wearing some painfully 90s sunglasses atop his bald head, the phenom did just that. No, I have decided to skip college and take my talent to the NBA. In the 1996 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Lakers were looking to free up cap space in order to land the most physically dominant player basketball had seen since Wilt Chamberlain, one Shaquille O'Neal. After four successful seasons with the Orlando Magic, Shaq wanted a new team in a bigger market. In order to free up the space needed to sign O'Neal, the Lakers made a draft day trade with the Charlotte Hornets, sending them center Vlade Divac and his behemoth contract in exchange for the 13th overall pick. Having impressed Lakers GM Jerry West during a pre-draft workout with that 13th pick, Kobe Bryant became the first guard ever drafted from high school into the NBA and just the sixth player to ever get drafted straight out of high school. He was so young at the time, just 17 years old, that his parents had to co-sign his rookie contract. About three weeks later, on July 18, 1996, the Lakers signed Shaquille O'Neal, now possessing everything they would need to create what would be one of the defining basketball dynasties of the 21st century. In hindsight, of course, there aren't 12 players in NBA history that would be taken ahead of Kobe Bryant. But it was a good thing that the draft shook out the way that it did. Kobe landed on the right team without the expectations to immediately make an impact that a number one pick would carry. He impressed in the summer league, and when he debuted in the NBA on November 2nd, 1996, he was the second youngest NBA player in history at just 18 years and 72 days old. Throughout that first year, Kobe acclimated to the professional ranks and the culture and pressure that surrounds a team with championship aspirations. He came off of the bench for most of the year, spending most of his time dazzling crowds with his athleticism, even winning that year's dunk contest. Despite his growing popularity as a rising star on the most famous franchise in professional basketball, though, he was kept on a pretty short leash that first season, averaging just 15 minutes a game and earning a spot on the league's all-rookie second team. He had held his own and had proven wrong everyone who had doubted his ability to produce and compete in the NBA straight out of high school. But for the most part, in the big picture, Bryant's rookie season was kind of unremarkable. At least it was, until the very last game of the Lakers season. In the playoffs, the Lakers met the Utah Jazz in the second round. After four games, the Jazz had the Lakers on the ropes with a 3-1 series lead. In Game 5, a do-or-die game for the Lakers, in Utah, LA found themselves shorthanded after Byron Scott missed the game with an injury, Robert Ory was ejected for fighting, and Shaquille O'Neal fouled out in the fourth quarter. Without their best player, in a win-or-go-home scenario in an increasingly close game, 18-year-old rookie Kobe Bryant put on his cape. Or at least, he tried to. He scored a team-high nine points in the fourth, setting up a potential game-winning shot that he airballed. For all his life, Kobe had dreamed of being the guy to take the big shots. In overtime, he found himself in a nightmare. He went on to airball three three-pointers in the period, two of which came in the last minute and would have tied the game. The Lakers season ended in a 98-93 overtime loss with Kobe registering 11 points on a putrid 4 of 14 shooting split. In the most important game of the season, with an opportunity that rarely presents itself to rookies, Kobe Bryant didn't just miss one important shot. He airballed four of the biggest shots of the game. All of a sudden, those doubters that he'd silenced in the regular season had reason to chirp. He's too immature. He needed to go to college. He needs an ego check. But, at the same time, how about the balls on the kid? To come into the game as an 18-year-old rookie and never stop shooting, even when you're throwing up bricks? Sure, they lost, and he had something to do with it. But still, it takes confidence. Which is exactly the kind of thing that makes Kobe Bryant so objectively great, and still so bitterly polarizing. We'll dive more into his confidence and mindset later, but this game exists as a surreally perfect foreshadowing of the Kobe Bryant experience. For everything that he did that reaffirmed his greatness to his supporters, the same things would be pointed to by his detractors as evidence of his flaws. 
On the one hand, Kobe is wired like few others. He believes in himself above all else. He'll miss some game winners, maybe even shoot his team out of some games, but he'll make those game winners too. On the other hand, that confidence and self-determination can come at the detriment to the team. Over the next few years, Kobe's responsibilities steadily increased as he continued to sharpen his skills. In his second year, he was runner-up for the Sixth Man of the Year award and became the youngest All-Star starter in history thanks to the league's fan voting. And in his third year, he assumed the role of the team's full-time starting shooting guard, starting all 50 games of the lockout-shortened 1999 season, averaged nearly 20 points a game, and was a third-team All-NBA selection. All the while, Kobe's improvement as an individual had a nearly linear relationship with the team's performance. Of course, at this time, Shaquille O'Neal was still the best player on the Lakers, and arguably the best player in the sport. But Kobe had quickly become one of the premier perimeter players in the world, giving the Lakers a 1-2 center-guard combo that hadn't been seen since the days of Kareem and Magic Johnson. Finally, before the 1999-2000 NBA season, the final piece fell into place. The Lakers employed the talents of the man who would retire with more championship rings than any other coach in major North American sports. The Zen Master, Phil Jackson. As his nickname implies, Jackson believed in a mindful, inclusive, holistic style of coaching, minimizing egos, encouraging cooperation, and often employing unorthodox methods to promote team synergy. The same principles he had used to guide Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls to six championships in eight years. Armed with the best center in the league, one of the brightest new stars in the sport, and one of the most prolific coaches in NBA history, the new look Lakers ripped off a three-year stretch that stands among the best a basketball team has ever enjoyed. The Lakers three-peated winning the 2000, 2001, and 2002 championships. And it's important to point out again that those three championship teams belonged to Shaq. They were his teams, and he was the finals MVP in each championship series. I say that because I know that this is Kobe's story, and it wouldn't be right to frame those titles as just his. But that's not to say that he didn't leave his mark on each championship, or that he wasn't vital to their success. Their first championship was perhaps their hardest. In the finals, Shaq was unstoppable. But true to form, Kobe made a mark in a truly memorable way. He had injured his ankle in Game 2, which had forced him to miss the rest of that game and all of Game 3. He returned in Game 4, tentatively easing himself into the action with a slow six-point first half. But as the game progressed, an opportunity presented itself. In an exceptionally close game throughout, he began heating up in the second half, keeping pace and finding his rhythm as the game came down to the wire and went into overtime. And there, in OT, after Shaq fouled out, Kobe Bryant put on the cape. Remember, this was a pivotal game four. Win and the Lakers go up 3-1. Lose and the finals would be tied at 2-2. Two and two. Without the best player in the league, Bryant submitted a heroic performance, nailing four of his five shots in the overtime period, with none more important than a tip-in off a missed shot, with just 15 seconds remaining, giving the Lakers a three-point lead. In total, Kobe scored 22 of his 28 points in the second half in overtime. He had come through on the biggest stage, had proven that he was the guy with the guts to take big shots, and the talent to make them. A far cry from air balls in Utah. After the game and the subsequent championship, a comparison that had once sounded outlandish no longer seemed so far-fetched. That comparison, of course, is of Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. It had started years earlier, almost from the moment that Bryant stepped onto an NBA court for the very first time. Remember, Bryant became the Lakers' starting shooting guard the year after Jordan retired from the Bulls. Without the most popular basketball player ever, fans and journalists searched for the player that would fill that gargantuan power vacuum. For years, the title of the next Jordan would be applied to dozens of young players. Players like Grant Hill, Allen Iverson, LeBron James, Vince Carter, Ray Allen, and Jerry Stackhouse, all at one point or another, 
had their talents, tendencies, and attitudes compared to number 23, all to varying degrees of accuracy and success. But none of them captured the real essence of Michael Jordan the way that Kobe Bryant did. Sure, they played the same position and were roughly the same height and build, but their similarities go far beyond their physical traits. The two shared a quality that few, if any, players have been able to emulate in the 20-plus years since the GOAT retired. Their drive. Michael Jordan was a famously competitive individual who was never outworked, who never lost a contest of who wants it more. He was willing to do anything to win and believed that only by applying the highest standard of excellence to himself and his teammates was it possible to achieve his goals. Could that sound any more like Kobe Bryant? Kobe's confidence, even from his rookie year in the league, was rooted in the fact that he had spent the time and done the work that no one else had. He was addicted to studying film, experimenting with, tweaking, and adopting new moves. He loved basketball as much as nearly anything else in his life, and tirelessly dedicated himself to becoming the best player that he could possibly be. Nearly every player, Shit, nearly every person whose career path intersected his has a Kobe Bryant working out like a crazy person story. And I haven't even mentioned the fact that Kobe Bryant had an array of talents and moves that looked eerily similar to Mike's. One of Kobe's first loves was the pull-up jumper, a move that gave him mastery of the mid-range, going back to his high school days. In those younger years, he had world-class athleticism, a lightning quick first step and delivered some of the famous dunks and posters to ever be printed. His jab step was absolutely lethal and he developed moves and combinations in conjunction with it that always kept the defense guessing. He was a defensive pest as a youth and was a perennial defensive team selection. He was a complete basketball player with very few holes in his game. And maybe most importantly, Kobe had a supernatural gift of locking into and channeling the moment, never allowing himself to be too far removed from it. He lived for the big moments, relished the chances when the raucous roar of the crowd would fall on his deaf ears as his total concentration fixed into place on the task at hand. Now who does that sound like? I have an entire video dedicated to the 2001 Lakers and how great they were in the playoffs, because they were great. In fact, it might well be the best postseason an NBA team has ever had. The combination of Kobe and Shaq was apocryphal for other teams. Both players had always known that on any given night, one of them could go off for 40. But the power of that team came from the realization that when one got hot, it wasn't an invitation for the other to take the back seat. They averaged nearly 60 points combined in the playoffs. They went 15-1 through the playoffs, as close to a clean sweep as any team has ever gotten. They faced stiff competition, becoming just the second team in history to defeat four straight 50-win teams and posted the highest net rating of any playoff team ever. And unlike the previous year, Kobe's contributions in the finals were almost just as impressive as his gargantuan teammates. His numbers reflected his newfound stature in the league as perhaps the sport's best all-around player, and the totality of his contributions just might be the best that a sidekick has ever produced in basketball history. And for the 2002 championship, Kobe played the role of assassin. He was a monster in the finals, accounting for 25% of the team's points, and was at his absolute best in the fourth quarters. As I say in the 01 Lakers video, Kobe never resigned to be Robin. Instead, he was the Batman to Shaq Superman. I mean, even in 03, when the Lakers had an underwhelming regular season and saw their title run end at the hand of the Spurs in the second round, Kobe emerged as a legit MVP candidate. It was the year he arrived as an authentic every night scorer and saw him begin to post the outlandish numbers that we would come to expect from him. He set the NBA record for most threes in a game against Seattle, he had a nine-game stretch of 40 or more points. He averaged 40 points a game for the entire month of February and finished the season third in MVP voting. There's a reason it's so rare to three-peat. There's a reason that there's only one instance of a team winning four or more championships in a row. It's fucking hard. 
You're playing every game of basketball possible from September or October until June, year after year, getting every team's best shot at you. Not to mention the attention and pressure that comes with being such a talented team, combined with the fact that if you are a team that is good enough to win so many championships, odds are you have some egos and some characters in the locker room. Those Lakers did something that has not been done in the nearly two decades since. Was it Shaq's team? Yes. Would those Lakers have won three championships without Kobe Bean Bryant? No chance. And speaking of egos, I've yet to mention the facet of those Lakers that is nearly as memorable as their talent. The power struggle between Shaq and Kobe. It is a famous beef. And the genesis of the beef, as far as I can tell, goes back to the 01 Lakers, when Shaq came into camp out of shape after just having had his best season ever, while Kobe grinded away in the gym all summer. Kobe wanted Shaq to work as hard as he did, and Shaq wanted Kobe to back off and respect the fact that the Lakers belonged to him. Of course, then you get snide attacks through the media, offhand comments that wound up in tabloids, and a general air of hostility and discomfort plaguing the team to different degrees at different times. Every time they were winning, things were simpatico. But when they lost, fingers got pointed, and everyone had an opinion on who was right, who was wrong, and whose team it should be. It was a Shakespearean conflict. These guys were so talented, and their styles complemented each other so well, but they were wired so differently. At the same time, they were both wired the same in the respect that they were both alpha dogs which, of course, only caused more friction. And that was their relationship for most of their time together. Begrudging allies, who doubled as a world-conquering duo. So after the three-peat, and after they finally fell off the mountain in 03, the question that needed answering was, can these two continue to coexist? Because the only way it seemed worth it for them is because they knew they were great together, and because they were winning championships. But before that question could be answered, before the 2003-2004 NBA season, Kobe Bryant was arrested in Colorado in connection with a sexual assault investigation. The charges were later dropped after the accuser refused to testify, and a civil suit was later settled out of court. Throughout the process, Kobe maintained his innocence and claimed that the relationship had been consensual. I have no interest in telling you what I think nor am I here to grandstand and lecture you on what you should think, how you should regard Kobe's legacy, or anything like that. Whether the accusations were true or not, Kobe did afterwards become a more vocal advocate for women in women's sports, especially as he became a father to four daughters. Think what you want about it. This video is not about this incident, and I do not have a conclusion you should take away. But it would be wildly irresponsible to talk about the legend of Kobe Bryant and not spend at least some time talking about the facts of an incredibly serious accusation that sullied his reputation and remains, in the most conservative language possible, a controversial point of contention. So, with all of that having been said, the 2004 Lakers season was a mess. Because they were the team at the time, they'd attracted players who were desperate to win a championship and escape the curse of eternal ringlessness leading Karl Malone and Gary Payton to don the purple and gold. Kobe was missing games due to court appearances, and Shaq missed 15 games due to injury, while the arrest, the super team roster, and the escalating feud between superstars cast a pall over the entire endeavor. And the feud was at an all-time high. Before the season, Kobe had criticized Shaq in an ESPN interview, questioning his leadership and willingness to sacrifice, as the season progressed, this bitter resentment seemed to grow into what seemed like real hatred for one another. But of course, they found themselves in the finals yet again. Because they were the best one-two punch ever. And because this time they got a little lucky. In those 2004 finals, the Lakers, with an absolutely star-studded roster of Hall of Famers and all-time role players, squared up against a Detroit Pistons team that were 6-1 to one underdogs. The Pistons were a team of misfit toys, players that did not fit the mold of superstars, that had nonetheless come together, playing with the type of unity and selflessness that belong in a Disney movie. 
only Ben Wallace was an All-NBA selection, and he was a second teamer at that. A lot of people lost a lot of money when the Detroit Pistons won the 2004 NBA championship. And make no mistake, the Pistons didn't just get lucky, they smoked the Lakers in five games. It's one of the great upsets of all time, right up there with the 2011 Mavs and the 77 Blazers. As time has gone on, the 04 Lakers have become something of a parable, something that warns against the dangers of ego, selfishness, divisiveness, a lack of chemistry, and star power thoughtlessly tossed together. In the following days, the Shaq and Kobe dynasty fell to bits. The castle had crumbled, and there was no putting it back together. Shaq had finally had enough and demanded a trade, landing on the Miami Heat. Gary Payton was traded to the Celtics. Carl Malone never played again. Point guard Derek Fisher left for the Golden State Warriors. And Phil Jackson retired after allegedly telling Lakers brass that he would not return if Kobe was still on the roster which just left Kobe. At this point, he may well have been the most reviled athlete in America. He had run Shaq, the best player on their three championship teams out of town, driven the great Phil Jackson into retirement, and was still being accused of a heinous crime. And the cherry on top, not that there really needed to be one, was the fact that Kobe Bryant played horrifically in the finals. He would put up 22 points a night, but on just 38% shooting from the field, 17% from three, and with over three and a half turnovers per game. He'd finally gotten what he'd always wanted. He was the alpha dog, the leader of the team, but only because he was the last man standing. And that's kind of what he evolved into. A cowboy, a gunslinger, the last man standing. He dropped a lot of his commercially appropriate image and just said, fuck it. He had no one left but the person he trusted the most in the world, himself. During Kobe's first season as a solo artist, Phil released a book titled The Last Season, going into detail about the drama of the Lakers, and particularly the shortcomings of the uncoachable Kobe Bryant. Kobe in turn revealed that he had created an alternate identity for himself, the Black Mamba, a creature that, as Bryant described, can strike with 99% accuracy at maximum speed in rapid succession. Aside from the fact that he gave himself a nickname, the Black Mamba title seemed extra comical after Kobe shot 43% on the year and the Lakers finished with their worst record in over a decade, missing the playoffs for just the fifth time in franchise history. It was the first time that Kobe had been able to be the undisputed best player of the team to put that team on his back and take full credit for the wins and full blame for the losses. And the Lakers stunk out loud. Which brings us to Kobe's 2006 season. Easily one of the strangest individual seasons a player has had in the last 30 years. The weirdness started early with a return to the sideline for none other than Phil Jackson. That's right just one year after roasting Kobe as a player, and to some extent as a person, Phil took up the reins and again became the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. The results that first year were somewhat mixed. The team finished with a 45 and 37 record and qualified for the playoffs, but it's the way they got there that remains noteworthy. Despite the results of the year prior and despite Phil's guidance in the triangle offense, Kobe doubled down. Hell, he tripled down on his warpath. He still wouldn't cede anything to a player he thought wasn't working hard enough. After all, why give the ball to someone who isn't as good and who doesn't work as hard? Kobe bet on himself and became a one-man army the likes of which had not been seen since the early days of Michael Jordan. I'm talking 35 points per game for the entire season, becoming just the fifth player to ever top 35 a night. I'm talking about a scoring average of 43.4 points for the entire month of January, the highest ever for a player that isn't Wilt Chamberlain. That season saw the legions of Kobe Bryant fans start to say to the world, look at this, this is our guy. He gives it all every night and he does everything. He works his ass off, believes in himself over everything and is unafraid of anything. Meanwhile, the rest of the basketball world entrenched itself into a totally different camp. 
They took up the banner that said that Kobe Bryant was a narcissistic ball hog who froze out his teammates and lacked the awareness or selflessness to include his teammates in all the ways that are necessary for winning. Nothing provided ammo for those two camps, like his two most famous performances of the year, perhaps two of the most famous performances of his career. In the first, Kobe Bryant scored 62 points in just the first three quarters against the Dallas Mavericks. As a team through three quarters, the Mavs had scored 61 points. Yeah, Kobe had outscored the entire Mavs team by himself. Insane. And then, just a few weeks later, the Black Mamba submitted the second greatest scoring effort in NBA history. On January 22, 2006, in a home game against the Toronto Raptors, Kobe Bryant scored 81 points. And make no mistake, this was not something that he did just for his ego or just to set a record. The Lakers needed it from him. After a somehow pedestrian 26-point first half from Bryant, the Raptors still held a 14-point halftime lead. In the second half, through sheer will, focus, and talent, Kobe kept the Lakers in the game, nailing shot, after shot, after shot, until they took the lead and eventually walked out of the building with a win. But of course, his detractors will point out the fact that he finished the night with just two assists. That was the kind of year Kobe Bryant had. He finished fourth in MVP voting, but had the second most first place votes. It was the first year where you either loved Kobe Bryant or you hated Kobe Bryant, with no in-between. And the weirdest thing of that season still hadn't even happened. In the first round of the playoffs, the Lakers matched up against the Phoenix Suns and the winner of the MVP award, Steve Nash. The Lakers took a 3-1 lead through the first four games of the series, with Kobe emphatically sealing a Game 4 win with not one, but two all-time clutch plays. And then, the Lakers blew it. The series went down to a seventh game, where Kobe had the most perplexing game of his career. A productive 23-point first half, followed by a one-point second half. Kobe Bryant took just three shots in the second half of the most important game of the season, in the midst of one of the great individual seasons ever. The same Kobe Bryant that scored 81 points in a game, checked out and refused to shoot for whatever reason, in what ended up being a 31-point loss. He was called stupid and selfish by none other than the Los Angeles Times. And just to pour salt in the wound, do you know who won the championship in 2006? The Miami Heat, led by a thrilling young shooting guard named Dwayne Wade and his partner in crime, Shaquille O'Neal. It does not get weirder than that. After the season, Bryant decided to make a change. Whether it was to rehab his public image, to signal a change in personality, or just because he wanted to, Kobe Bryant changed his number before the 2006-2007 season from 8 to 24. Did it work? Not exactly. At least, not at first. He was still committed to taking the most shots and scoring the most points. For the 2007 season, Kobe led the league in scoring, won the All-Star Game MVP, and was a first-team selection to both the All-League team and the All-Defensive team. He had 10 50-point games that season, four of which came in a row, which is something that not even Jordan ever did. The Lakers, meanwhile, ended the year with another mediocre record at 42-40. and 40. Once again, the Lakers faced the Suns, and once again, the Lakers lost. Kobe's reputation was taking hits left and right. He had now either missed the playoffs or lost in the first round every year since his breakup with Shaq. He was a marvel of a talent, truly the closest thing to Michael Jordan that there has ever been or likely will ever be. He was the most entertaining one-man show in sports, whose only misfortune was falling in love with a team sport. It cannot be said that he did not work hard. It cannot be said that he did not want to win. But at the end of the day, he did not respect his teammates enough to trust them with the ball. 
Whether it was their talent, their work ethic, or both, they did not measure up to the impossibly high standard of Kobe Bryant. Jordan faced the same problem in his career, eventually finding his solution by forging his teammates in the grueling furnace of his own wrath. When all was said and done, Two of those Bulls championships hinged on plays in which Michael Jordan gave the ball up in crucial situations in the finals. The idea that Kobe Bryant in 2007 would ever pass the ball to a teammate in the final moments of a game, especially with something like a championship on the line, is laughable. Were his teammates crap? Yeah. Kwame Brown? Smush Parker? Of course the Lakers weren't going to win a championship with that. But even still, Kobe's contemporaries like LeBron James and Tim Duncan were making names for their ability to foster cohesion and make teammates better. Instead, Kobe Bryant was all alone in the solitary trapping of his own creation. Which brings us all to the 2007-2008 NBA season. The second half of Kobe Bryant's career and the true birth of the Black Mamba. The 08 Lakers entered the season with high hopes, if for no other reason than the reacquisition of Derek Fisher, the point guard who'd helmed all three championships of the Lakers' three-peat. More than anything he did on the court, Fisher made the greatest impact by getting Kobe to buy into a team concept. He was someone Kobe could trust. Not much, maybe not even enough, but a little. Halfway through the year, the Lakers sat at 30 and 16 contending for top seeding in one of the most competitive Western conferences in history. The Lakers' fortunes were improving, and on February 1st, the team pulled off a blockbuster trade, sending a lump of nobodies and two future first-round picks to the Memphis Grizzlies, in exchange for the best player the Grizzlies had employed in their franchise's young history to that point. Power forward, Pau Gasol. I'm not kidding when I say that Pau was the best player in Grizzlies history at that point. When he left, he was the franchise leader in minutes played, games played, field goals, free throws, offensive rebounds, defensive rebounds, blocks, and points. The Spaniard was a legit seven-footer with athleticism, adept post-scoring, mid-range scoring, lethal jumpers, hook shots, fakes, up and unders, and an edge that earned him Kobe's respect. With that, the Lakers were off to the races. Having earned Kobe's respect and trust, the chemistry between the two began to flourish as they game-planned on the floor in Spanish to keep opponents unaware. In the 29 games that Pau Gasol started for the Lakers that season, they lost just five games. By season's end, the Lakers had secured the top spot in one of the tightest conference races ever. Kobe had been humbled. He'd had the opportunity to take every shot, control every possession, and impose his singular will on the game with no restrictions. And it wasn't enough. He couldn't win on his own. And when that lesson set in, when the Lakers brought back Derek Fisher and traded for Pau Gasol, when players like Lamar Odom developed into contributors, Kobe finally trusted. He never gave away the keys, he never changed his nature, but he finally started putting the puzzle pieces together. At season's end, he was a first-team All-NBA selection, a first-team All-Defensive selection, and for the first time in his illustrious career, Kobe Bryant was the NBA regular season's most valuable player. In the playoffs, he led the Lakers through that loaded conference for a berth in the NBA Finals, emphatically reasserting himself as a franchise player and a leader. The opponent of the Lakers in those 2008 Finals was none other than the Boston Celtics. And if you're watching this video and you've made it this far, I'm certain I don't need to go into too much detail about that rivalry. In essence, the NBA is built on the Celtics-Lakers rivalry. As of the creation of this video, the Lakers and Celtics have won 17 championships apiece. That's 34 of the 75 championships ever won in the NBA. 45%. They have met in the championship series 12 times, with each featuring a litany of the greatest players the game has ever seen. And this was no different. Across the court from Kobe and Pau stood the Celtics' new big three, Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, and Ray Allen. 
Every finals has something at stake. They all affect legacies and create icons and legends. But the stage doesn't get much bigger. The lights don't get much brighter than Lakers Celtics. And for the first time since 1987, the two met. After 21 years, the rivalry had been revived. Despite the improvement the Lakers had made, the Celtics proved too much to handle. Paul Pierce had an excellent series, winning the finals MVP, and was said by many to have outplayed Bryant. The death nail of the series came in game four, when the Lakers blew a 24-point third quarter lead, watching as the Celtics set a record for the largest finals comeback since 1971. In the final game of the series, the Celtics set another record for the most lopsided victory in a championship clinching game ever. The tide had turned yet again for Kobe Bryant. There was no storybook ending, no capping off of his newfound stature as a lead his team to a championship guy. Instead, people started wondering if they jumped the gun on giving him that kind of distinction. Questions still surrounded Kobe. He had gotten the Lakers back to the finals, but could he really be a guy who could lead them to a championship? Was this a real shift in attitude, or was this just a one-time thing? Does he really get it? Enter the Black Mamba. Following the 08 Finals loss, Kobe went to a place he had never gone to before. He'd always been known for his work ethic, but he doubled down on it, pushing his body and abilities like never before. During the offseason, he represented the US during the Olympic Games and quickly became the unquestioned alpha dog on the famously loaded Redeem team that featured players like LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Paul, and Carmelo Anthony. Matched up against Spain and his running mate Pau in the Olympic final, Bryant set the tone, running right through his Laker co-star. The message was simple and obvious. I don't care that we're boys. I don't care that we're teammates. Right now, we're opponents, and I will fucking destroy you. After bringing the gold medal back to America, Kobe began scouring nearly every available source he could find for information and lessons on leadership and success. He asked successful people in all manner of fields about their processes, even reaching out to composer John Williams about his work. His pursuit of knowledge was so great that the great Bill Russell cited Kobe as his favorite active player because Kobe had devoured Russell's autobiography, Second Wind, and had gone so far as to call Russell and pick his brain on all matter of things. Whatever it was, those years spent losing, watching Shaq win a title without him, the public scorn, being coached by Phil Jackson, or some combination of all of it, something had gotten through to him. The lesson had been learned. He started putting it together in 08, enough that the Lakers were good enough to make a run at the finals. In 2009, he and the Lakers were eager to prove that they could win it all. How did that 2009 season shape up for the Lakers? 65 wins in the regular season. The third most in franchise history. It was Kobe like we'd never seen him before, with stories abounding of him inviting teammates out to dinner and connecting with everyone on the roster, from Powell, Fisher, and Lamar Odom, all the way to guys like Luke Walton and Sasha Vujicic all while maintaining his otherworldly reputation as a scorer, competitor, and all-around threat. He had his highest shooting percentage since 2002, broke Bernard King's 25-year-old MSG scoring record, was a first-team everything, and was the co-MVP of the All-Star game, along with who else but Shaquille O'Neal. Kobe was denied a second consecutive MVP only because of the emergence of LeBron James and his 66-win Cleveland Cavaliers. He'd scored more points in years prior. He'd won the MVP the year before. But the venom in the fangs of the Black Mamba was never deadlier than in 2009. All season long, NBA fans had anticipated a collision between Kobe's Lakers and LeBron's Cavs in the finals for a number of reasons. They were the teams with the two best records in the league, led by the top two MVP vote-getters, with Kobe representing the past and present, while LeBron, at just 24 years old, was the future. It would have been a watershed showdown, and its implications would have echoed throughout the league for decades. 
The Lakers held up their end, advancing to their second consecutive finals. But in one of the shocking upsets of the decade, the Orlando Magic bounced the Cavs in six games, setting up a Lakers Magic Finals. Now, like I said earlier, every finals carries weight. There is no championship that doesn't count, no ring that isn't earned. But to say that the matchup wasn't a letdown would be a lie. Nonetheless, the heavily favored Lakers took their opponents seriously. In the first game of the series, Kobe exploded for 40 points, eight rebounds, and eight assists. Not so much channeling the old Kobe, but showcasing this newer, smarter, more evolved incarnation. He trusted his teammates, gave them their chances, and took over when the moment demanded it. The Los Angeles Lakers won the 2009 NBA championship in five games. And after 32 points, five and a half rebounds, and a series-high seven assists, Kobe Bryant was named the finals' most valuable player for the first time in his career. The top of the mountain, back at last. He'd been a part of the most dominant duo in basketball history, yes. But now he had proven that he was on the short list of guys who could be the league's very best player and lead his team to an NBA championship. And, you know, now he had as many rings as Shaq. Not for nothing. But even still, there were whispers, doubters, people who poo-pooed the championship, saying that the Lakers wouldn't have stood a chance against a team like the Celtics or the Cavs, and that they lucked out by matching up with the Magic. Reinvigorated by his last remnants of doubters and by the team's acquisition of former Defensive Player of the Year Ron Artest, Kobe assumed his fully evolved form. At 31 years old, in his 13th professional season, he had finally reached the stage of his career where he had the wisdom to match his talent. He wasn't the most athletic player in the league anymore, but no one did a better job at utilizing that athleticism. He had a veteran's know-how and a champion's confidence, a deadly combination in a man like Kobe Bryant. Over the course of the 2009-2010 season, Kobe became the Lakers' all-time leading scorer, passing Jerry West on February 1st, 2010. He came up clutch throughout the season, time and time again, delivering iconic play after iconic play. Which is not to mention the fact that he fractured the index finger on his right hand, elected not to take any time off, and hit one of those game winners just five days later. It's just another story of Kobe's maniacal will to win and another anecdote of his inhuman pain tolerance, which is something that I haven't really been able to touch on yet. And actually, there are a few things I haven't mentioned or won't be able to mention that I want to touch on. All of his other injuries that he played through, his atrocious rap career, the fact that he would play every guard on his team one-on-one -on -one to 100 throughout his career, how he would break out the underbite when he was really cooking, Paul Pierce's poop game, the vetoed CP3 trade, Kobe's weird crown tattoo, the fact that the video of him jumping over the Aston Martin is fake, that time he got served a two-piece combo by Chris Childs, how his marriage to Vanessa caused a rift with his parents, resulting in this heartbreaking picture because he couldn't celebrate his 2001 championship with them, and how he learned some Slovenian so that he could shit-talk Luka courtside. The Lakers wrapped up the 2010 regular season with the best record in the Western Conference yet again. Kobe was first team everything again and finished third in league MVP voting. Pau continued to flourish as a double-double machine next to Kobe, and the rest of the team fit perfectly around them. A well-calibrated, two-way machine chock full of heady veterans who had all passed the Kobe Bryant toughness test. LA marched through the Western Conference defeating the Oklahoma City Thunder, Utah Jazz, and Phoenix Suns on their way to their third consecutive finals. And who should the Lakers find standing opposite them at this final stage of their journey? The last obstacle in their quest to become back-to-back -back champions. The Boston Celtics, of course. Do I even need to set this series up? You've got the last two league champions squaring off in the finals. Those two teams happen to be the Lakers and Celtics, and the series will feature at least five surefire Hall of Famers, almost all of whom are in their primes. And don't forget that this is a rematch of the 2008 Finals, 
adding a layer of dynamics to the series that becomes so insane that I can't even articulate it. Which for our purposes, all adds up to a chance for Kobe Bryant to cement himself once and for all, for all the haters and doubters and fans alike, as one of the very best basketball players who has ever played the game. After five games, the Lakers trailed the Celtics three games to two. They had lost game five by six points, despite a 38-point outing from Kobe. His Achilles heel had once again begun to reveal itself. His unwavering confidence meant that he never met a shot he didn't like. But it also meant that he lacked the scoring efficiency of a player like Jordan. And in the crucible of such a high-stakes series, Bryant might have been too amped up and was forcing the issue against an incredible defensive team. Facing elimination and the prospect of a second finals loss to the Celtics in three years, the Lakers stuck out their chests, kindled their pride, and submitted a masterful defensive performance in Game 6. They beat the Celtics by 22 points and held Boston to just 67 total points, setting up a do-or-die, winner-take-all game in Los Angeles. Everything came down to the, the best, best two words, words in sports. sports. Game, Game seven. seven. If you thought Kobe was going to take a back seat now, you have not been paying attention. Which didn't necessarily spell good things. Kobe's Game 7 goes down as another of his most perplexing. He couldn't help himself. He wanted it too bad. He only made six of his 24 field goal attempts, determined to be the hero. Still, he made up for his poor shooting by crashing the boards to the tune of 15 rebounds and forcing himself to the line, especially in the fourth quarter. With the game nearing its close, the Lakers were desperately holding on to a six-point lead. But after a Rashid Wallace tray cut the Laker lead to just three points with 90 seconds remaining, the Lakers' season was on the line. Score, and you push the advantage to two possessions. Miss, and the Celtics have a multitude of options to tie the game and potentially force overtime. So what do you think? Knowing what you know about Kobe Bryant, someone who has struggled with trust his entire career, driven by maybe the most unshakable confidence an athlete has ever possessed, in a game where that confidence has been on full display to the detriment of his team, in the final minute of a Game 7, as he tries to ice the game and cement his legacy, what do you think happens? Brian looking for our chest. That's a three. He passed the ball. He passed the ball, and 60 seconds later, the Los Angeles Lakers were champions once more. What is there to even say? I know that's kind of what I'm here for, but doesn't this footage just tell you what you need to know? It meant everything. A second consecutive championship. Another finals MVP. Getting the last laugh. Writing a dramatic chapter in one of sport's greatest rivalries. Validating the championship the previous year. And of course, for Kobe, his fifth championship meant that he had one more than Shaq. Even the most outspoken critic even the most die-hard Celtic fan was forced to admit Kobe Bean Bryant was one of the greatest players of all time. The following few seasons only served to reinforce this fact. The Lakers didn't three-peat, losing in the 2011 postseason to the eventual champion Mavericks and in the 2012 postseason to the eventual Western Conference champion OKC Thunder. But in those years, Kobe earned another All-Star Game MVP tying him for the most ever with four. Two more first-team all-league selections, two more all-defensive team selections, and continued adding to his resume as an exceptional scorer and crunch time assassin. But it's clear in hindsight that this was the twilight of Bryant's career. Phil retired after the 2011 playoffs, ending his illustrious coaching career with 11 rings, the most by any coach in basketball history and Kobe was limited in the 2012 season due to injuries to his wrist, nose, shin, and head. Still, the Black Mamba had entrenched himself in Los Angeles as the star of stars. The Mamba mentality had become folklore. He'd been a member of five championship teams, 
and was still adding to his legacy. He occupied a very special place in Tinseltown. When celebrities wanted a night out, when they wanted to go to a show and see a master at work, they went to see Kobe Bryant. And in the 2012 Olympics, on the heels of LeBron's coronation as champion, Bryant gracefully ceded power to his young counterpart. After another gold medal, the Lakers made one last desperate attempt to build a contender around their 34-year-old superstar. Two rivals of Bryant's were brought in, two-time MVP Steve Nash and Bryant's foe in the 2009 Finals, Dwight Howard. And after a disappointing 1-4 start, the Lakers brought in basketball visionary Mike D'Antoni. All for naught. Bryant and Howard ignited an infamous feud due to differences in attitude and work ethic, echoing the Kobe Shaq beef, while Nash struggled to stay healthy, let alone effective, as he pushed 39 years old, which put Kobe in the position to do it himself. Nothing new. Once again, Bryant became the most entertaining one-man show in sports. At the halfway point of the season, he was leading the league in scoring, but the Lakers were a paltry 17 and 25. Without playmakers like Derek Fisher or even Lamar Odom, and with the deterioration of Nash's abilities, D'Antoni then made Bryant the de facto facilitator of the Lakers, with more control over the offense and with even more time spent with the ball. Kobe thrived in that role, and the team's record responded. It was one of the more impressive feats of his career. He created opportunities for teammates, maintained his own individual excellence, and dragged LA into the playoff race. Coming down the stretch of the season, still fighting for a spot in the postseason, Kobe was pressing on the accelerator to the tune of nearly 40 minutes a night. On April 12, 2013, the Lakers hosted the Golden State Warriors. Kobe was running on fumes, having played monster minutes in the last seven games, including four in which he essentially played all 48 minutes of the game. Heading into that Friday evening, Kobe had played seven consecutive quarters of basketball without a substitution. There were multiple instances throughout the game that made it obvious that Kobe's body was under a massive strain. But it wasn't until the fourth quarter that his body finally quit. Trying to make a move around Harrison Barnes, Bryant was fouled and fell to the floor in a heap, grabbing at his ankle. After walking it out and catching his breath, Kobe stepped to the line and sank two free throws before being removed from the game. Subsequent tests revealed that he had torn his Achilles tendon, ending his season. Which just for posterity means that Kobe hit two free throws on a torn Achilles tendon. The Lakers went on to make the playoffs and were swept in the first round by the San Antonio Spurs without Bryant. That was it. That Achilles injury was the end of Kobe Bryant's career as an elite basketball player. The miles he'd put on his body over the past 17 seasons had finally taken their toll. Despite an intense rehab process, he played in just six games the following season because of a knee fracture. But Kobe being Kobe, he refused to accept that his career was ending. He rehabbed again and played in the first 27 games of the Lakers 2015 season averaging 26 points and 35 minutes a game. But he got to those numbers by being the most inefficient volume scorer in the league, taking the most shots in the NBA and shooting under 40%. He didn't come with an off button. There was only one way for Kobe to play, hard. And as he'd done countless times before, when he was cold or he wasn't in rhythm, he made it a point to double down and shoot himself out of the slump. Just look at this clip. He's shooting over five defenders here. And because he's the best tough shot maker in league history, he almost made it. In December, he passed Michael Jordan for third place on the list of the NBA's all-time scoring leaders. In January, he tore the rotator cuff on his right shoulder. It was an injury that would sideline him for the remainder of the season, having played just 35 games. But when I tell you that he returned to that January game and played the rest of it left-handed, are you even surprised? The Lakers finished the 2015 season with a 21-61 record, the most losses in Laker history. 
his body had truly betrayed him. And despite the fact that there was no precedent for a player of his age, coming back from so many serious injuries and playing at an even moderately productive level, Kobe didn't quit. On October 28, 2015, at 37 years old, he debuted his 20th season with the Lakers, setting the record for the most seasons spent with a single team in NBA history. One month later, on November 29th, he made the announcement that everyone knew was coming. He announced that the 2015-2016 season would be his last, with a poem published in the Players' Tribune titled, Dear Basketball, saying in part, this season is all I have left to give. My heart can take the pounding. My mind can handle the grind. But my body knows it's time to say goodbye. The announcement kicked off a retirement tour for the ages. Everywhere he went, the arena sold out. Every time he checked into a game, the crowd would roar. After every road game, he was given gifts, made to watch video montages, and asked to make short speeches. Everyone wanted one last glimpse of Kobe Bryant in a Laker jersey. Even Sacramento, even San Antonio, and yes, even Boston. Which was in total contrast to his play. I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but Kobe's play in his last year was truly dreadful. He was taking the sixth most three-pointers in the league, but was the league's worst three-point shooter. He shot just 35% from the field, but was 15th in the league in shots per game. He was playing so poorly that even he admitted to playing poorly, essentially saying, I know I'm playing like shit, I don't like that I'm playing like shit, and I really am working hard to not play like shit. Whatever. The Kobe retirement tour was cool. He deserved it. One of the greats was saying goodbye. He deserved a crowd. Kobe's basketball career ended on April 13th in a win over the Utah Jazz. It was just the Lakers' 17th win of the season, marking the worst season in franchise history. The Mamba was out. He never played professional basketball again. By the numbers, he retired as the NBA's third all-time scorer, a five-time champion, an 18-time All-Star, a four-time All-Star Game MVP, a 15-time All-NBA selection, including 11 first-team selections, a member of 12 all-defensive teams, the most ever by a guard, and was the leading scorer of the decade of the 2000s. But beyond just the figures and the stats, Kobe was the player of his generation. The worthy successor of Michael Jordan as the league's uber competitive alpha dog, inspiring the next generation of NBA greats. Kobe and Tim Duncan both have arguments as the best players of that era, but Kobe's impact and cultural relevance dwarf that of the venerable big fundamental. What do you yell when you throw a wad of paper into the trash can? He epitomized the idea of working ceaselessly to fulfill one's own potential. The Mamba mentality. Jordan was a maniac, but his fire was pathological. He couldn't stand to lose at anything. That took him to casinos and golf courses, always in need of another win. Kobe's dedication during his career was purely toward being the best basketball player he could possibly be. He didn't care if he was popular. He even admitted that he wasn't a very good friend, not one to remember birthdays or send presents. But in his own words, friends can come and go, but banners hang forever. After his retirement from basketball, Kobe turned his attention toward filmmaking and content creation. In one of his first creative endeavors, he worked with former Disney animator Glenn Keane and composer John Williams to turn his poem, Dear Basketball, into a short animated film. The film was nominated for, and won, the Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film in 2017. Barely a year after retiring from basketball, Kobe Bryant had won an Oscar. He was just that kind of guy. From there, he set his sights on creating content with four people in mind, his four daughters. 
As a devoted girl dad, he'd become disillusioned by the kind of programming and content that was directed at young girls. He felt like his daughters didn't need story after story about a damsel in distress, a girl who exists purely as a love interest, or a woman who needs saving. Kobe wanted to change that. To that end, he also supported the sports his daughters were active in, advocated women's sports, the WNBA, and coached his 13-year-old daughter Gianna's basketball team. On January 26, 2020, Kobe and eight others boarded a charter helicopter for a flight from Orange County to a basketball game in Newberry Park. With Kobe was his Gianna, John and Carrie Altobelli, their daughter Alyssa, Sarah Chester and her daughter Peyton, coach Christina Mauser, and pilot Ara Zobayan. At approximately 9.45 that morning, the helicopter was enveloped in a thick fog and crashed on a hillside in Calabasas, California. All nine people on board were killed. The tragedy defied words. And although this video is about Kobe, I want to make a point to recognize that he was not the only one lost. Just because they weren't famous basketball players does not make any of their deaths less tragic. It feels like by talking solely about Kobe, we're ignoring the fact that other people lost their lives, that other families were destroyed, that three teenage girls didn't get the chance to grow up and write their legacies. So before going further, I want to acknowledge and remember them. But the world did lose Kobe Bryant too. Just like that, one of the most recognizable sports figures was gone. So much was written and said about it at the time, and his connection to fans was so personal that to try to describe the void he left feels almost like a waste of words. Tributes poured in from across the world. His death reminded everyone of the fragility of life, urging many people, public and otherwise, to mend old relationships and be better people. The NBA renamed its All-Star Game MVP award in his honor. Kobe was posthumously inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in May of the following year, and on October 11, 2020, nine months after the crash, the Los Angeles Lakers won the NBA championship for the first time in a decade. He is the second best player who has ever played his position, a cultural icon and a generational talent. The Lakers are basketball's signature franchise, and perhaps not to say he is the best, but for what he represented and for all the things he did, Kobe Bryant is the greatest Laker of all time. Kobe's death was surprising because he did not seem like someone who could die. He was an invincible warrior, an indomitable will. He was supposed to become a filmmaker, become an elder statesman with a gray beard, who would sit courtside at the All-Star Game in the finals and shake hands with the newest crop of NBA greats. Still, nobody can say that he died without living, loving, and experiencing life to its fullest. The gunslinger walked away with an empty clip. Which is the closest thing we can find to consolation when remembering Kobe's life and his death. Once he decided to be himself, he was relentless and uncompromisingly him exemplified best by his very last game in the NBA. In the days leading up to the game, expectations for Bryant were high. Despite the Lakers' struggles that season and despite his poor play, this was Kobe Bryant we're talking about. It was basically a foregone conclusion that he would leave everything out there. He'd have the greenest of green lights, and he was going to take advantage of it. But what would happen? Would it be an ignoble ass-whooping like Dan Marino's last game? Or could he deliver some magic one last time? Thinking of Kobe's last season and his approach to that last game, I constantly think about a quote from Grantland's Brian Phillips, who wrote about Kobe's last season that January, saying, If preserving his sense of who and what he is means ending his career loudly and embarrassingly, he will be as loud and embarrassing as he can. The game itself was an event. Nearly every celebrity you can think of was in attendance. Snoop Dogg, Kendrick Lamar, Nicholson, 
Jay-Z, Kanye, Shaq, and so on. The pressure was on. The lights were bright. It wasn't a playoff game or a finals game, but whatever the result, it would be remembered. The tone of the evening was set early as Kobe took 13 shots in just the first quarter. He only connected on five though, registering 15 of the Lakers' 19 points, with ballistic cheers reverberating throughout the Staples Center on every make. He sat for half of the second quarter, scoring just seven points on two of seven shooting as the Jazz started to pull away. At the half, Kobe had scored 22 points on seven of 20 shooting. It's hard to capture the feeling of that night in hindsight. Every eye was fixed on Kobe at all times, whether he had the ball or not. Every heart started beating a little faster the second his hands touched the ball. Every breath was held when he summoned the last vestiges of energy that those legs had left and rose up to take a shot. It didn't matter that he wasn't shooting well. He'd never been known for his pinpoint accuracy. It mattered that Kobe Bryant was doing what we'd hoped, leaving every last ounce of energy, spirit, and prayer out on the hardwood in the building he helped make famous. The Jazz held a 15-point lead over the Lakers as the final half of the career of Kobe Bryant began. He played the entire quarter and captured our attention one last time. He took a ridiculous 14 shots in the third quarter and made half of them, registering 15 points as the Lakers cut the Jazz lead down to nine, entering the fourth quarter. When the fourth quarter began, Kobe Bryant had scored 37 points already his second highest point total of the season, how much could he possibly have left? In the final quarter of the final game of a 20-year career, after all the injuries and setbacks, what could this guy have left in the tank? Just enough. Every shot he took in that fourth quarter looked like it was drawing energy from Bryant's very soul. Each one another note in the swan song of the greatest Laker ever. He shot and shot and shot, willing the ball into the basket time and time again. He passed 40 points, then he passed 50, the third oldest player to do so ever, sucking air into his fatigued body, demanding that it cooperate just this one last time. All of a sudden, with less than two minutes to go, the Lakers were in a two possession ball game could the Mamba strike one last time? With one minute left, the Lakers trailed by a single point. And with 34 seconds left, Kobe Bryant took his 50th shot of the game, the last he would ever take in the NBA. And he made it. After the Jazz failed to score, they intentionally fouled Bryant, sending him to the free throw line with the chance to score his 59th and 60th points of the night. The Lakers won the game 101 to 96. Kobe's last shot proved to be the game winner. He became the oldest player in NBA history to score 60 points in a game and set the mark for the most points scored in a single game by any player in the 2016 season. He took 50 shots to get there, the most in a single game by any player since 1967. That, to me, is the consolation. The game was as Kobe as Kobe gets. An inordinate number of shots, an ungodly number of points, a crowd screaming his name, and of course, the game winner at the end. The last time we saw Kobe Bryant on a basketball court was the most fitting end to the career of the player of his generation imaginable one final masterful performance. How perfect is it that that is how he left the game? An icon, a winner, a legend.